Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 14 When Tom awoke in the morning, he wondered where he was. He sat up and rubbed his eyes and looked around. When Then he comprehended. It was a grey dawn. There was a delirious sense of repose and peace, a deep prevailing calm and silence of the woods. Not a leaf stirred, not a sound intruded. Upon great nature's meditation, the beaded dewdrops stood upon the leaves and grasses. A white lie of ashes covered the fire. A thin blue breath of smoke rose straight in the air. Joe and Huck still slept. Far away in the woods, a bird called another answered presently. The hammering of a woodpecker was heard. Gradually, the dark, cool, dark grey of the morning whitened as gradually sound smoke deployed and light manifested itself. A marvel of nature, shaking off sleep and going to work, unrolled itself in a music boy. A little green worm came crawling over a different leaf, lifting two thirds of his body in the air from time to time and sniffing around and proceeding again. He was measuring, Tom said. It, when the wedge was approached him of his own accord, he sat as still as a stone, with his hopes rising and failing, by turns as the creature still came towards him, or seemed inclined to go anywhere, or go elsewhere. And when at last he considered a painful movement with his book of body in the air, and then came to slightly down upon Tom's leg, going a journey over him, his whole heart was glad, for that, that meant he was going to have a new suit of clothes. Without the shadow of a doubt, a gaudy, piratical uniform. Now, as a procession of ants appeared from nowhere in particular and went about their labours, one struggled manfully by the by with a dread spider five times as its beak, itself its arms and lugged straight up a pear tree trunk. Brown spotted labour climbed the hizzy height of a grassy blade, and Tom bent down to close to it. And said, Ladybug, Ladybug, fly away home. Your house is on fire. Your children's alone. He took wing and went off to see about it. Which not did not surprise the boy. We knew of old that insect was courteous about confrontations. He had practised upon its stupidity more than once. A tumbleberg came next, ever heaving sturdily his ball. A tom t- touched the creature to see it shut his legs against his body and pretend to be dead. The birds were fairly inviting by this town. A cat bird and woven monka lit a tree over Tom's head and filled it with early invitations. I saw a neighbour's enraptured enjoyment and a thrill jay slept down. A flash of blue flame and stopped a twig almost within a boy's reach, cropped his head to give to one side and eyed the boys with consuming curiosity. A grey squirrel and a big fellow of a fox kind, so scaring along, sitting up at an interval to inspect and chatter at the boys to the wild things I've probably ever seen a boy human being before, I scarcely knew whether to be afraid or not. All nature was wide awake and stirring now. Long lances of sunlight pierced down through the dense Followed fear far near. A few butterflies came fluttering upon the scene. Still, Tom stood up. Other pirates all clattered about with a shout in a minute. The two were stripped and chasing after and tumbling after over each other in the shadowy, shadow low, limpid water of the Walter's white sun bag. Oh, they felt no longing for a little village seeping in the distance beyond the majestic waste of water. A fragrant, a vagrant current of a small rise, the river carried it off their raft, but this only gratified them. Since it's going, since it's going, something like burning the bridge between them and civilization. They came up to the camp, one fleet refreshed, glad hearted, ravenous, and soon had the fire, fire blazing up again. Huck found a spring of clear old cold water by, by his many cups of brood oak or hickory leaves and felt the water soften with such a world lit world with charm as that would be good enough substitute for coffee. Like, while John was slicing bacon for breakfast, Tom and Huck asked him hold a, hold a minute, they stepped to a promising nook 
in the river bank and threw in their lines almost immediately rewarded that they had reward. Joe had not had time to get in plant impatient before they were back again with some handsome brass, a couple of sunbur- uh, sunburch and a small catfish, which is enough to make quite a family. They fried the fish with the bacon and were astonished, for no fish had ever seen such a dish before. They did not know that the quicker a freshwater fish is on fire, after he's caught the better he is. They reflected a little upon that this, with a source open air, sleeping, open air, exercise, baby, a little bit larger bit of hunger may bake too. They lay around in the shade after breakfast while Huck had smoked and went off through the woods on an exploring expedition. They trumbled greedily along over decaying logs through tangled underbrush along the solemn bright smokes of the forest hung from the crowns to the ground with drooping brigadia of grain ve- great ve- vines. Now they had come, come upon snug hooks nooks carpeted with grass and jewelled with flowers. They found plenty of things to be delighted with, but nothing was to be astonished at. They discovered that the island was about three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. A shore it lay close it to was only separated now by a narrow canal, not hardly two hundred yards wide. It took a swim about every hour so to close upon the middle of the afternoon when they got back to camp. They were too hungry to stop the fish, but they fared sumptuously upon the cold ham, and then threw herself down in the shade to talk. The talk soon began to drag, and died. The stillness, the similarity, and the brooded in the woods, a sense of loneliness, began to tell upon the spirits of the boys. It then to thinking, fell thinking, a sort of undefined, lying crept upon them, their stim shape, presently, it budding homesickness. Even Finn, the red-handed, was dreaming of his footsteps and empty coat hogs' heads. But they were all ashamed of their weakness. None was brave enough to speak his fault. To full the same time now, sometime now, the boys had dreamfully conscious of a victor, uh, sound in the distance, just as one sometimes is of the ticking of a clock, which he does, takes no distinct night of. But now this mysterious sound came more pronounced than false recognition. Boys started to glance at each other and then each then each reassured its listening position attitude. There was a long silence, profound and unbroken. Then a steep sudden boom came floating down out of the distance. What is it? said Joe under his breath. I wonder, said the son Wasma. Ain't it thunder? said Huggerbury, in awed tone. Curse thunder! Hark, said Tom. Listen. Tom, talk. It was your time then, seen at age. Then the same muffled boom, troubled the same and hush. Let's go and see. They ran to their feet and hurried to the shore towards the town. They parted the brushes on the bushes on the bank and peered out of the water. The little stream ferryboat was about a mile about a low village, drifting from the current, a broad deck seemed crowded with people. There were little, great little shifts rowing about, floating with a stream in the neighbourhood of Mary and Wood boat. The boys could not determine what the man in them were doing. Presently, a great jet of white smoke burst from the very boat's side. Its banging rose in a lazy crowd, and some dull throb of sound was born to the listeners again. I don't know. I know how. I know that now, screamed Tom. Someone's drowned. That is, that's it, said Huck. They done that last summer when Bill Turner got drowned and shot a cannon of the water and makes him come up to the top. Yes, and they makes loaves of bread and put quicksilver in them and sees them afloat. Whenever they, there's anybody that's drowned, they were afloat right there and soon. Stop. Yes, I heard about that, said Tom Joe. I wonder what makes the bread do that. Oh, he ain't that bread so much, said Tom. I reckon it's mostly what they say over it when they start out. But they don't, didn't say anything over it, said Huck. I've seen them and they don't. Well, that's funny, said Tom. But maybe they say that they do themselves. Of course they do. Anyone might, anybody might know that. But he's argued and uh, agreed. There was, some, there was a reason. And Tom said, because of an ignorant lump of bread, 
un- instructed by the incarnation, could not be expected to act ever eternally, as set upon as Aaron with such gravity. But I jingles, I wish I was over there, now, Joe said. Ah, too, said Hutt. I'll give heat to know who it is. But he still listened to watch. Presently, a really thought flashed through Tom's mind. He exclaimed, Mize, I know who's drowned. It's us. It felt like heroes in an instant. Having known, here was a gorgeous triumph. They were missed. They were mourned. Hearts were breaking on their accounts. Tears were being shed. Accusing memories of unkindness. The poor lost lads were rising up. Unveiling regrets and remorse were being indulged. And best of all, they parted with a tall tale of the whole town. The enviable boys, as far as this desert, desert inarity was concerned, that was fine. This was fine. It was well worth it. Well, to be a part after all. Twilight drew on the ferry boat, put back, went back to her accustomed business. As scythes disappeared, the pirates returned to camp, a jubilant with vanity, over their new grandeur and illustrious trouble they were making. They caught fish, caught supper, and ate it. They fell to guessing at what the village was thinking and saying about them. The pictures they drew of the public distress on their account were gratif- gratifying. To look upon, from the point of their view, their point of view. But when the shadows of night closed in, they gradually ceased to talk, and sat up, sat gazing the fire. Their minds empty, wandered elsewhere. The excitement's gone now. Tom and Joe could not get get keep back thoughts of sudden persons at home who were not enjoying this fine frolic as much as they were. Misgiving came. They drew. Grew troubled and unhappy, a sigh or two escape. Unawares, by and by, Joe intimately ventured on barn. A roundabout feeder. Fair, ventured upon a roundabout feeder as to how the others might look upon a return of civilization. Not right now, but Tom withered him with derision. Thank okay. you. Huck being uncommitted yet, Tom gained, joined in with Tom. The waverer quickly explained. I'm glad to get out of the scrape with a little taint of chicken hearted homesickness clinging to his garments as he could. Minnie was eventually, eventually laid to rest for the moment. As the night deepened, Huck began to nod, and presently to snore, Chodo full of necks. Tom lay upon his elbow, motionless for some time, watching the two intently. At last he got up cautiously onto his knees and went searching along the grass. The flickering reflections hung flung by the fire, picked up and inspected several large semi cylinders of the thin white bark of sycamore and finally closed too, which seemed to suit him. Then he knelt by the fire, and probably wrote something upon each of those with his red needle. When he rolled up and put in his pocket, took it pocket, the other he put in Joe's hat and moved it in, uh, to a little distance before, from the owner. He also put it in a hat. And that certain schoolboy treasures of almost an estimable value among them a lump of coal chalk, a little Indian rubber ball, three fish hooks, and one that kind of one of those kind of marbles known as a sure naught crystal. Then he had tiptoed on his way cautiously among the trees. He felt he was out of hearing, and straight away broke with a keen run in the direction of the sandbag. Well, wow.